the term evidence-based surgery or evidence-based medicine is uh, in vogue uh, nowadays. And uh, every policymaker, every person, as I did now, I asked Professor Assam Al-Halabi to give us uh, an evidence for uh, the decisions and the clinical decisions that we take. And this uh, revolutionized the, the uh, practice of medicines in the recent years, actually, uh, that you always should have uh, an evidence to support uh, what we are doing. Actually, uh, the evidence-based medicine idea is not only uh, limited to the uh, surgical research or the uh, clinical uh, studies that are published in the literature, but as well as it depends on the clinical expertise and the skill of the person that is dealing with the case, as well as the patient's preference and expectations, of course, and the available evidence in the literature. These three arms or these three parts constitutes what is known as the cycle of the evidence-based maps. In fact, as I said, that uh, if you want to be uh, to go updated and to go abreast with the uh, medical literatures, this is a very difficult job nowadays because of the voluminous amount of literature that is produced every day. And so the people started to think about how, how can we review the body of the evidence or the body of the literature, literature so we can come to conclusions with some subjects or topics. And so we had here what's called the narrative reviews. Narrative reviews is the review that we all know where we ask somebody expert in the field to give us an overview about a topic. For example, duodenal injury, pancreatic cancer, uh, uh, colon bypass or whatever. And so the expert is knowing, he knows from where he got the information and he will go and bring the uh, papers and uh, researches from the literatures and prepare, prepare for us a review that can give us an idea about the scope of the topic that we are in need to know about. But in fact, the uh, one who is going to review this literature literatures always is biased by his own opinion and his expertise. So most probably what will happen that he will go and pick the cherries uh, that support his views rather than giving a balanced view about the topic that we are facing. So the people started to, uh, to try to find a solution for these biased reviews so we can have a more accurate and more uh, useful uh, conclusions from the body of the uh, literature and the evidence to help us in taking decisions or take clinical decisions. So it came to the idea of the systematic reviews. The, the systematic review, as its name implies, that involves a protocol like the primary uh, uh, researches. There is a protocol where there is a focused question that is formulated by the researchers, and there is a search for the search for the literatures to and the internet about the available uh, studies that discuss these uh, research questions, and then we do further steps in this. Uh, type of reviews where we uh, make an assessment of the quality or what we call critical appraisal and the quality appraisal and quality determinations of the studies that we are facing or that we are found and we pick the good ones and discard the bad ones. Two reviewers are doing this process and if any discordant between the two the, this uh, dispute is solved by uh, consensus between the two and then we extract data from these studies, and then we look at the data that we have. If we think that we can combine the results that we obtained from these uh, studies, so we can go furthermore to what's called meta-analysis. So meta-analysis can be looked at as a quantitative systematic reviews. It is a way, or it is a statistical way, that can help us to give the uh, audience an estimate or an average estimate about the effect size of any interventions through looking at the different results in the individual studies. Um, here I am asking the questions, do you think that narrative views by this definition and by this talk is a bad option or not? In fact, it is not. But we have to understand its limitations and know that a narrative review can be of value 
because it can give us a, an overview and uh, it can give us a, a, a generalized scoping uh, review about the topic that we are dealing with. Actually, uh, I would like to reflect on some things uh, that I think it's very important. What is the difference between data that we are collecting in our research and the information that we should take from these data? Actually, here comes the rule of statistics because always we, I, I ask myself, why we are doing statistics in our research? Why statistics is part of our clinical research? In a simple way, the statistics gives a meaning for the data that we are uh, uh, collecting, and this data, by applying for them statistical methods, will be converted into information. These informations can help us to take decisions. As you know, that uh, this was ever questions that I thought about. Medicine is an art or a science. If we look at uh, uh, the uh, name of the doctor in the early uh, era uh, and in the past, it was the wise man. So what is the difference between why we didn't call him a knowledgeable man? Actually, there is a difference between be being knowledgeable and being a wise man. There is a difference between knowledge and wisdom. And actually, I found a very important and very interesting example uh, to uh, illustrate this. Uh, all of you know that tomato is a fruit or vegetable. Actually, actually, tomato is a fruit. So we know that tomato is a fruit. But is it wise to use the tomato in fruit salad? This represents what is meant by wisdom. So you may be knowledgeable, but you have to apply your knowledge in a wise way. And I think that the example of tomato is very interesting. Uh, another important thing, um, when I look at or I see our uh, colleagues talks about their results, uh, we have to know that the most important part of your research is the method section and the results section. And actually, for me, the most part is the result. Because actually, this is what you had found, what you had created what you had added to the body of the knowledge. What are the important things if you are faced with the results of a study? What are the important parts or items that you have to look for? Usually, I see people uh, looking and presenting their results, and they come and say, p-value is less than 0 0.5, less than 5% or more than 5%, so it is significant and insignificant. And the, we are happy now that we had reached uh, uh, some scientific uh, uh, cover for our results or our study. In fact, the B value is the least to concentrate upon. What you have to concentrate upon, and this is if you want, would like to think of the results as a, a theatrical analogy, I mean like a play, the hero of the, uh, this theater or play will be the effect size. So please, please, please look at the effect size. Effect size, effect size. This is the most important. This is the hero of your work. This is the hero of the results section and of your whole manuscripts. The effect size that you had achieved or that you had observed or noticed in your study. And if we look at the second rule or the second uh, uh, rule of a, 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 the artist in the play, we'll find that the confidence interval is coming next. And actually, I would like to summarize what is confidence interval. Confidence interval is a measure of precision. Precision is the reverse of variation. So the more you have variation, the uh, less you have precision in your result, results. And why precision and confidence intervals comes to play a role in our studies? Because, as well, you have to remember that we are doing our research on a sample of patients with all, all the problems that uh, is found around sampling and sample size and all these things. But actually, what we are inter interested in, not in the people who, who ha we have sampled, but on the population from which this sample is taken, 
and for, from whom our results will be applied. So why we have to determine the confidence interval? Actually, we determine the confidence interval to say how far we are certain about our results in these studies if we repeat this study for an infinite time of, or for an infinite number of times. That means the confidence intervals with a range, low and high range, represents where is the actual result of the, your interventions is found in the populations uh, in, so in a very precise way. So confidence intervals, which we have to specify by 90% or 95%, give you an, um, an, an estimate of the degree of uncertainty of your estimate that you had reached in your study. I hope that I am clear. I mean that always you have to give the effect size with the confidence interval of this effect size to give us an interpretation or an understanding of what will happen if we use the same method and the same uh, steps that the researcher had used what I am going to expect in my patients. So knowing the precision of the effect of estimate is very important. B value is important, very less important actually, and it can work as a cameo. Cameo means they shut off in the blade. That's because it doesn't tell anything except about the chance of having the results that you had obtained by chance, the probability of having the, the result that you had obtained by chance. So it doesn't contribute too much to the impact of your study and your results. I hope th this, this is very important concepts that I think that it's not easy to, uh, to, to, to adapt and to swallow, but I think, I hope that I, I, I bring it more clear to your minds. Uh, another important thing, do we think of the meta-analysis? As we said, the meta-analysis is a statistical test. You can look at meta-analysis as the t-test that we know in statistics. Can we know or can we look at this meta-analysis just as a grand average or we are doing many things and there are more information in the meta-analysis that can help us to have a more deep understandings of the studies that we are looking for. Actually, the grand mean that we are getting in the, uh, in, in the meta-analysis is a weighted pooling effect. Weighted by what? It's weighted by the study size, the sample size, and the effect size of the study. The larger the sample size, the larger the effect size, the more weight each study will take into the final weighted average in the meta-analysis. But because we are dealing with biological phenomena where heterogeneity is the norm, we don't have homogeneous, uh, homogeneity in the medical uh, practice. Always we have variation. Even between the, uh, your practice or the personal practice, we will find that some patients is behaving in a different way than the other. So the concept of heterogeneity means that because we know this, we should first determine how far the heterogeneity is there in between the studies that we are pulling in the meta-analysis because if it exceeds certain levels, this means that the meta-analysis will not be possible, the results will not be combinable, and we will stop at the stage of systematic reviews. So heterogeneity is very important to identify. And suppose that we identified heterogeneity. That means variation in the studies that represents the meta-analysis. So how can we make use of this? Actually, we should explain why the dif there are differences between the studies of the same topic or of the same questions is there. By studying these differences, we can know about very modifiers of the effects or the estimate effects in the different studies, which may be a methodological one, the way that we are doing the studies, or clinical one. For example, we are dealing, some studies are dealing with more severe uh, stage of the disease or older patients, male or females, 
or patients in uh, a high stage of tumor or patients with less stage tumors. This study of heterogeneity will determine the, our ability to do meta-analysis and as well it can give us an insight about why the difference is there. So this can be a hypothesis generating way of thinking. I mean, if we know why the differences are there, are there, we can put a hypothesis about future studies that can help us to answer questions that was not easy or was not uh, answerable before. As well as we have always lesson, or we, we will all, always hear about subgroup analysis and stability testings. All these means and methods are ways to help us to know where is the variation, why the variation is there, and can help us solve the uh, disputes if the results of the meta-analysis are discordant or are not identical. An important, uh, I, in, in, the first, in, in the next few minutes, I will describe for you, for you some terms that seems uh, you will see in the meta-analysis and may not be clear. What is the funnel plot? The funnel plot is this diagram which is seen on the screen. And actually, the funnel plot, because as you, as you know that meta-analysis and systematic reviews is a way to combine studies. So if you missed some studies because they are presented in languages other than English, they have no positive effect because you know that the literature or the journal editors are likely to publish the uh, positive uh, researches rather than the negative ones. So if we omit these types of studies, we may not have a good idea or a good overview about the body of evidence. And so our uh, meta-analysis will be affected by what is called a publication bias. The final plot is a graphic presentation that can give us an idea about is there a publication bias in the meta-analysis? So combinations and uh, uh, our belief in the results of the meta-analysis will not be so strong, or we don't have this publication bias. On the left side, there is, as you see, a midline, uh, a midline and around it, there is a symmetrical distribution of the, the, these squares. The squares represents the different types of study, and the size of each square represents the sample size of each study. And as you see on the left side, there is a symmetrical funnel plot. So here we can be uh, to some extent sure that there is no publication bias. On, on, on the contrary, on the right side, you will, you will see that there is outliers on the left hand side. And there are some, some uh, studies that are reaching the outside of the confidence intervals. And this is known as asymmetrical funnel plot. And this gives us an indication that there is a publication bias. And this casts a doubt about the uh, results of the meta-analysis that we are facing. Of course, all these items need uh, too many explanations and lengthy, uh, too lengthy uh, lectures to uh, discuss. But I thought that knowing what is funnel plot is important and I think if you look at now a funnel plot, you can say, yes, it is for publication bias. This is symmetrical, asymmetrical. And so we are going to uh, uh, make our mind about the value of the result of this meta-analysis. As you know that in surgery, all the ways of dealing with the research is different from, for example, the internal medicines and physiotherapy or all these systems or disciplines in medicine. Because you know that heterogeneity is a, uh, is, is, is a norm in surgery and not the homogeneity. I mean that the way that we are doing surgery is different. My doing of the same surgery may differ from Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Assam, and even I may do one case in a different way than the other. So this makes the uh, uh, finding of homogeneous studies that can be pulled in a meta-analysis, especially in surgery, is different. As well as I said, the standardization of techniques. We should have a standardized technique so we can say that the outcome is due to 
the way that the technique is done and not because of any other thing else. And as well, as you know, learning curves, the way that I'm doing surgery now is not the same 10 years back. The way I do the 10 case is not the first case. And this as well costs a doubt about the value and the, uh, the value of the uh, researches and papers that is presented in the surgical meetings and gives uh, us uh, a doubt that we may not be able to combine the results of these uh, researches. And as well, the, what's called the clinical equipoise. Clinical equipoise is a very important concept. Equipoise means we are not certain. But imagine that a patient will come to you and you, you want to put him in a randomized studies and you will say to him, I will do that for you an operation that I am not sure of its results. I think that this is not an acceptable situation. So in many of the situations in surgery in particular, the surgeon knows that or believes that what he is going to do is beneficial to the patient. So doing randomization to have the best feeders for the meta-analysis uh, or, or to do a strong and good meta-analysis may not be possible in surgery because you may not be able to uh, randomize your patients because you know for your sure, for yourself, that this is the best operation rather than the other one. So the lack of the clinical equipoise is a hurdle, is an obstacle in doing a good randomized studies. And so it's a hurdle in doing meta-analysis or a good meta-analysis that can give a robust results and, inf and, and uh, conclusion that can guide our decision making. What about pediatric surgery? In fact, I looked at the literature and I found a paper in 2017 where the uh, researchers tried to look for the quality of the uh, meta-analysis and systematic reviews in the pediatric surgery literatures. And the conclusion was that we are left with only 25% good meta-analyses and systematic reviews in pediatric surgery. Maybe one of the uh, reasons or some of the reasons that I had mentioned in the previous slides, and this gives us an indication that we should work very hard to understand and to improve the quality of the meta-analyses and the systematic views, especially in our specialty. And here there is a warning that you should not take the meta-analysis or the systematic views for granted because you should know that the results of the meta-analysis depends on the types of the studies that had been pulled in the systematic views and meta-analysis. And there is a statement that is saying garbage in, garbage out. So we should consider and look at the systematic views and meta-analysis, especially in our speciality, very suspicious. And this doesn't mean that we should stop doing them, but we have to try to work hard to improve the quality of the studies that we are, uh, or we are doing. Is there a place in the literatures that can save us the uh, effort and the expenses that is needed to do systematic reviews and the meta-analysis? Yes. And this is because of this man in, on the screen. This is Arki Cochrane. He is a very prestigious epidemiologist from UK who had introduced the uh, and uh, uh, formulated the ways of doing systematic reviews and meta analyses in medicine in general. And a collaborative group of prestigious and intelligent people gathered, came together to form what's called the Cochrane Library. If you uh, search the internet about the Cochrane Library, you will find uh, different groups that they are concentrating their efforts on different issues of interventional questions and therapeutic and diagnostic questions in medicine. In medicine. And uh, these uh, uh, Cochrane reviews are very helpful to uh, inform us uh, as surgeons for our clinical decision making in on everyday life. Uh, I would like to um, draw your attention to something very important. If you look at this picture that's on the screen, you'll find about 10 uh, pictures around a central one. This is a computer-generated uh, picture, the picture in the central part, 
and the uh, these pictures that had been generated takes features from each of the 10 uh, pictures that's around it. So do you think that dealing with average always is good? What I mean, how, how can you understand the differences that is found in the 10 pictures around these pictures as existing if you have only the picture in the central part? What I mean is, if we have small number of cases that we are dealing with in our studies, especially in pediatric surgery, we have to present the raw data. We have to present the data of every patient, not the average of the data. Because in many times and in many situations and scenarios, averaging hide the differences that is present. And the differences is very more important or maybe more important in decision making, especially. You should remember that you apply these results to your own patients, to your individual patients. You are not taking the results from an average study and apply it to, apply it to an average people. All what you need to do from the surgical literature is that you go and ask questions, try to answer these questions, to take the answers and to apply them on your individual patients rather than the average patient. So here, be aware of the average. It can hide differences. Very important. At the last, this is what's called the forest plot. You know that you see this. Uh, figure in the meta-analysis and all what I'm going to do now is giving you some clues about the uh, figure, these figures and about the, its components. As you see, the figure is divided into rows and columns. If you look at it, it will be six columns and a number of rows. The number of rows represents the individual studies that is presented or that is uh, we are taking and pooling and using them in the uh, meta-analysis process. Very important is the line in the middle, the vertical line in the middle. Usually you will find one of two numbers, either one like here or zero like here. The difference is, is this is the line of no difference. That means I did an operation and I had five cases good, five cases bad. So in, in my uh, intervention group and in the control, five and five. So five min minus five equals zero. So this means that there is no difference in the management. What we are looking for in the meta-analysis is to see, does the result of the meta-analysis favor the intervention or is unfavored to the intervention. As you see in this diagram, what favors the intervention is on the right of the uh, line of no difference, which is zero, and the unfavor favorable is on the left of the line of no difference. And then look at the uh, figures around the line of no difference. You will find a box, and these boxes for each study and it is in different sizes and you have whiskers coming from each box in fact the box represents and the size of the box represents the size of the study the sample size big study 1000 will be be a big box small study five uh, five uh, uh, patients will be a very small box and the lines horizontally represent the range of what we call the confidence in Turkey. Okay? So we have boxes of different sizes, represents a different uh, uh, sample sizes or different study sizes, and a confidence interval that we are talking about. And in the lower part, in the most lower part, we will have a diamond. And this diamond represents the bold estimate. That means the pooling of all the studies above is represented by the diamond down. And here, the vertical dimension of the diamond represents the estimate of effect or the size of the estimated effect or the pooled estimated effect. And 
the horizontal dimension of the diamond represents a confidence interval. An important finding as well is if you look at these boxes that in these rows around the uh, line of no difference, you will find that they are almost overlapping. The overlapping of these boxes and whiskers mean that there is a homogeneity in between these studies. In another example, if you find these uh, boxes and whiskers away from each other, this means that there is heterogeneity and that meta-analysis may not be possible or if we have an accepted level of heterogeneity, you have to think about why these heterogeneity is there and you have to explain them and to understand them. And of course, <clears throat> on the left hand side downwards, you will find something known as I square. The I square is a statistic that is derived from a test of heterogeneity of the studies that is pulled in the meta-analysis. And this number is very important, as I told. So the heterogeneity presentation, either graphically, overlapping of the confidence intervals, or by the I-square statistic that represents a percentage, uh, that it will give us a percentage that give us uh, an idea about the heterogeneity. And this means that these studies can be combined or not. I hope that uh, I, I, I give some uh, illustrations of the uh, different parts of the figures of what's called the forest plot, because these two figures uh, are the two main figures that you will see in a meta-analysis, the forest plot, with, which represents the different studies, the uh, weighted uh, size of all these studies, and the combined uh, effect size that is estimated by the use of the statistical, of course, software, because having all these results or these figures needs the presence of uh, a statistical software that can help us uh, to uh, uh, draw these figures and so can give us uh, presentations of the results of our meta-analysis. There are other types of meta-analysis. It can be cumulative meta-analysis where we are upgrading and updating our meta-analysis uh, every uh, period of time. Or individual patient data, instead of combining uh, studies or an average, we combine the data of individual patients. Or what's called network meta-analysis where we uh, may not be able to directly compare two interventions so we can compare them via proxy, that means we compare A and B and B and C, and by uh, knowing the relationship of B, A and B and B and C, we can know the relation between A and C. Uh, I just want to uh, mention these uh, uh, terms because you may find in uh, studies that you find in the literatures, and I hope that uh, I uh, uh, was able to give you some insights about uh, these terms and these uh, techniques that is used in the science of systematic views and meta-analysis. Thank you. Jacqueline, how are you, Sam? It's a very tough uh, uh, topic. Like, and you, you tried uh, to make it as simple as possible. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, now, can uh, if anybody has a comment or a query, he can raise his hand, and Sad, I will open the, the mic for him. Thank you very much, Dr. Sam. Shukran. Yes. Dr. Muhammad. I'm afraid nobody is uh, raising his hand. And no one is uh, raising his uh, it's, uh, it's a tough one. Yeah. Either, either it is very clear or uh, nothing. I, I, I hope if you can bad. make a summary in a paper form. Uh, it is very important to anyone who's conducting research to know what you're saying. Not only research, anyone who's uh, reading papers, evaluating. Uh, so I think if you try to make it in a form of a, a small writing things, it would be very great uh, 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 for us. 
Okay. Well, it seems that Dr. Aswam went and uh, brought for us a paper about the concealed uh, duodenal perforation. Okay, if Dr. Osama is there, yeah, it is very uh, nice to give us uh, uh, an idea about uh, this paper that you are presenting for us. Dr. Osama? Dr. Osama? Yeah. Dr. Mohammed. Okay, can you hear? Dr. Ah, yes, please. Can you hear now? Yes, can yes, I? we hear you. Yes. I'm just, this is... Uh, uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, to congratulate you for the presentation of meta-analysis. This is a beautiful and a piece uh, of, uh, yeah, this is a very, very, very beautiful presentation. And as Dr. Ahmad Zaki said, it's a little bit difficult, but uh, for interested people, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very nice. And for people who do not have uh, uh, enough knowledge, it's just a stimulus for them to go and read more and more about this kind of, uh, of uh, study designs and this is uh, meta-analysis and similar case. The, I just put this one uh, because we have uh, some discussion in the second case about the perforation and they in a rule for uh, con, con, uh, non-conservative uh, uh, treatment and then just uh, remembered uh, this article this was a narrative review just and they say uh, actually there is a rule if the, the perforation of the duodenal perforation is not non-contained this there should be some search however if it is contained perforations and by contained perforation that means that there is a documented perforation by CT and by uh, contrast or contrast, the, there is the bullying of the contrast study outside the, the, the lumen of the duodenum, but it is not a free, uh, uh, a free uh, contamination of the proteinia. Yes. And they say yes. uh, there, there is, there may be, there is actually a rule for and yes. this, this stable yes. treatment. There is a rule for that. But yes. again, but, again, I would like to say we have to be but, very careful in interpreting this data and not to encourage anybody with a, a, a traumatic duodenal depression to say we're gonna we're gonna do management conservative it should there be is an important uh, thing very, Dr. Uh, yes there is an important thing that you had said yes. contained yes. perforation contained yes. perforation means that there is no drainage outside the uh, the abdomen contained means that the perforation is found around the duodenum and it goes back by the ct scan it's not revealed outside. This is the important thing that if you have a contained perforation, you will have like a diverticulum or something like that. It will not be drained outside. It will drain inside the duodenum. What I mean, this is the definition of contained uh, perforation. As well, like what is happening in the esophagus. As well, if you have a contained esophageal perforation, contained mean that the perforation is around a part of the esophagus, but the dye is not going outside, it is going again inside the uh, hollow viscous. In these situations, yes, maybe, but this is, uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't know whether this situation is uh, common or not, but the, the, the important message is, duodenal perforation, please, don't wait because infection will complicate your situation. This is my, uh, my message to you. Agree, agree, agree. definitely agree. Definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, we finished. I think we, we need to thank everybody who participated today. I'd like to thank you, Sama, for your uh, effort and uh, putting uh, this uh, very interesting uh, night together. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Nibiki, Amr Zaki, uh, Nader, Nasif, uh, Jamal, and Sharif. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Isham and Dr. Mohamed Abdel Latif, uh, everybody who participated tonight. I'd like to thank you all, and inshallah, we'll meet in two weeks' time, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shukran. Thank you. 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 Thank you.